Hi everyone, so I promised there would be another video on Turning Red. The first one was just a goofy, uh, oh, here's my thoughts, guys, I just finished watching it. Haha, <laughs> I, and when I first watch a movie, I always just turn off my brain and try to enjoy the movie, and the second time I watch the movie, I'm like in nerdy art mode. And I've gotta say, I like Turning Red even less after watching it in, you know, careful nerdy art mode. Uh, now, I, I already talked about, like, all the nerdy Twitter stuff and the dumb Twitter debates in the first video, so we're going to throw that all aside. So if you're worried that this is just going to be me ranting about the culture war or dumb arguments on Twitter, I really want to throw that away and be fair with this movie, meaning I want to go through this movie scene by scene. And the reason I want to do that is I think it's trying to tell an important story, but I feel the way it's doing it is missing something really important. So Turning Red is basically a story about a daughter and a mom who fight each other, uh, reconciling, which is a kind of story I think is really beautiful and important and needs to be told. Uh, but let's contrast it with a few others. So here are a few other movies. We're not going to rehash them all, but I'm, I'm sure you've seen at least one of these movies. Finding Nemo is about a father who's a fish reconciling with his son who's a fish. It's Marlon and Nemo in Finding Nemo. Wreck-It Ralph, uh, they're not a father and a daughter, it's about Ralph and Vanellope, but when Ralph meets Vanellope, she sort of becomes like his adopted daughter. Their relationship parallels a father-daughter relationship in a lot of ways. How to Train Your Dragon is about Hiccup, and his father, Stoic the Vast, is a big, strong Viking. Uh, the, they also have a strange relationship, and that movie's about the, the two of them reconciling. And the Pixar movie Brave is about... Uh, the Scottish Princess Merida and her mother, Queen Eleanor, they have a fight, and they spend most of the movie trying to reconcile. So the first time I watch Turning Red, I say, oh, that's sweet. They're trying to do a nice thing about, you know, learning not to argue with your mom. And I just thought, well, I don't like it as much as those movies. As I've rewatched it, uh, I think they're making some really big mistakes in the story editing part of the movie. There are decisions the characters make that don't make much sense and I feel like uh, in it, it, I admire what it's trying to do but I feel like in the end it's not doing what one of these parents and kids uh, fighting with each other and solving the conflict is supposed to do. So if you're familiar with any of those four movies I mentioned just keep them in the back of your mind and now we're going to focus on Turning Red itself. Let's dive right in. I think the opening scene is really effective because it follows a film 101 rule. Introduce your main character, introduce her main problem. The number one rule in my family, honor your parents. They're the supreme beings who gave you life, who sweated and sacrificed so much to put a roof over your head, food on your plate, an epic amount of food. The least you can do in return is every single thing they ask. Of course, some people are like, be careful. Honoring your parents sounds great, but if you take it too far, well, you might forget to honor yourself. Luckily, I don't have that problem. So do you get it, kids? Vinyl record scratch. This movie is about obeying your parents versus finding yourself as an individual. Malin Lee introduces herself and proudly boasts that ever since she turned 13, she's had a lot more independence and she's in control of her life. But we, the audience, suspect that she may not be as mature as she thinks she is. Oh, crap. Malin does brag and shake her butt and dance around and do goofy poses and make silly faces. But I think it's important to note that a lot of the adult characters find her annoying, and several characters actually explicitly say they find her pretty annoying. So I think she's supposed to be annoying in these early scenes. Mildly annoying, young lady. We are introduced to Malin's besties. Uh, the first, Miriam, I must confess, I the first time I watched this movie, I spent the whole first 30 minutes thinking Miriam was a gay boy because she looks like Chef Linguini and Ratatouille, but Miriam is a girl. The other two besties, Priya and Abby, provide some comic relief, but it's mostly Miriam who has most of the screen time and has most of the dialogue scenes that are relevant to Malin's character development. So you really only need to remember Miriam for now. The bully at school is Tyler with the poofy hair who thinks Malin is an overachieving dork narc. I accept and embrace all labels. <laughs> The besties interrupt Malin's monologuing so that they can all ogle at a cute boy who works at a convenience store. 
Uh, by the way, of note in this scene, I think a lot of the visual comedy actually works. The characters move in a funny way. Visual gags like this one where they're all peeking around the corner work. But I also still thought that Miriam was a boy this entire scene, which makes it a lot more funny to me. Mmm, it's heaven. Malin's weirded out by her friends getting starry-eyed over this weird-looking boy, and so she tells them, you know, real handsome boys are like the boy band for town. And uh, we spend, a, we have a romantic montage of the girls just being in love with for town. And this stuff's going to be really, really important. For town, we're going to be seeing a lot of for town for the rest of this movie. So memorize their faces, everybody. <laughs> I confess, I laughed very hard at the boy band jokes. Girls loving boy bands, that's that's true to life. It's funny because it's true. The girls want to go sing karaoke, but Maylin can't go because it's cleaning day with her mom. Miriam uh, jokes that she'll let her go if she can pass the gauntlet, and they do some silly dancing. But it's actually a pretty important scene because this is establishing that of the three, Miriam gets Maylin the most, and Miriam's very gracious to Maylin. So she's basically trying to have a little bit of fun with Maylin and let her go gracefully, even though she knows she can't come with them to do karaoke. This is going to be important because, as we learn later, Maylin's mom does not approve of Miriam. Ha <laughs> ha, silly dancing! But seriously, I like the pose work. It feels cartoony. It feels fun. So after Maylin leaves, we see this gag, and this is important because it establishes that Maylin's friends do not like her mom that much and clearly think that Malin is under her mom's thumb. She's so brainwashed. Malin starts monologuing to the audience again, and this is continuing the theme of Malin's two worlds. She lives in a traditional, very conservative Chinese cultural world, and she lives in a very free, goofy, Western, I'd say individualistic world at school. It's not all about me, you know? So this is a very different side of Maylin. We've seen how she's goofy and silly and thinks she's really mature and free at school, but in the Chinese cultural world, she's very concerned about responsibility of her community and of her parents. You're 10 minutes late. What happened? Are you hurt? Are you hungry? Um. So Maylin's mom basically perfectly fits the stereotype of the overprotective tiger mom. This is exaggerated to ridiculous proportions and played for laughs. And also the family engages in ancestor worship, which is probably deliberately chosen to reemphasize the point of worshiping your ancestors, worshiping your parents, is creating Malin's big giant emotional problem in life. We get some montage scenes of them worshiping their ancestor, who's the guardian of red pandas, important, and we see Malin's life caring for the temple. It's all very feng shui. Uh, she's been trained in Zen, and that'll be important. Maylin has been has learned to use Zen to keep her emotions in check. Instead of honoring a god, we honor our ancestors. And not just the dudes, either. By the way, I like the subtle detail that, well, maybe not so subtle detail that Maylin plays the, the panda spirit in the little show they give to tourists and visitors that's setting up that she's actually going to turn into the panda spirit later. Foreshadowing! So we in the audience already have the sense that Malin's mom is overbearing. But also of note, Malin seems to be concerned about having her mother's approval. And it's been emphasized that they actually do seem to have a concern for one another. Malin's mom prays for her daughter to their ancestor. Uh, Mei Mei has like a child's drawing in the temple. She, it, th this connection to her Chinese culture is actually deeply important to her. May's father is a chef, and we get a montage sequence that's like sexy anime prawn scenes. And he seems really intimidating, but actually he's kind of a goofball. But uh, this is going to be important because he's not a very strong personality. It's clearly the mom who dominates this household. He should have listened to his mother and married Ling Yi. Totally. The scene is played for laughs, but it's reinforcing the theme that... Everything in their culture, in their soap operas, is reinforcing, obey your parents, do exactly what your mother says. So a commercial for Four Town comes on, Malin gets excited, and her mother clearly thinks these are a bunch of hip-hopper degenerates. So the question is, though, how does Malin handle conflict with her mother? Uh, I don't know. Some of the kids at school like them. You mean Miriam? That girl is odd. 
Oh, snap. So, Malin lied. She is hiding who she is from her mother. We see some establishing shots to show what a little perfectionist Malin is when she's studying, and she starts drawing Devin, the weird guy at the convenience store from earlier. And she furiously starts drawing her uh, vivid fantasies, uh, whatever those are, of Devin. So it's, it's, it's implied that maybe she's drawing sexual fantasies with Devin, but then later when we see what they are, they're not sexual. It's like, oh, she draws him as a handsome mermaid boy giving her a hug. So it's, it's the PG version of a girl drawing hentai in secret and trying to hide it from her mom. Do you want a snack? Cool, great, thanks. Don't look at the notebook. Don't look at the notebook. Don't. She looks at the notebook. And of course, because she's an overprotective mother, she flies into a comedically exaggerated frenzy. Uh, she interrogates Malin. Malin admits it's Devin at the convenience store and her mom drives her straight to the convenience store to yell at the guy and accuse him of trying to seduce her daughter and all of her friends at school see and she's horribly horribly embarrassed so not only is malin's mom overprotective she's overprotective to a insane level she is making her daughter's life much much harder than it has to be what <laughs> what a the daisy mart has lost a loyal customer today okay karen that degenerate won't come near you again. Now, is there anything else I should know about, Maymay? Nope. All good. So her mom's a bitch and she's repressed. You sicko! What were you thinking? Why would you draw those things? Those horrible, awful, sexy things! But it's even worse than that, because when Maylin argues with herself, she takes her mom's side in her own internal argument. So not only does her mom embarrass her, Malin blames herself when her mom embarrasses her. You are her pride and joy, so act like it! So that night, Malin has a nightmare, and when she wakes up, she's a giant red panda. And the first time you watch it, it's pretty jarring because she doesn't, like, uh, sneak out at night and break a magical artifact or uh, go sneak into the temple to uncover hidden secrets, and that's what turns her into a panda. She just wakes up the next morning, and she's a giant red panda. Now, uh, has Malin made any big choices so far? Well, she doesn't do anything stupid like that to turn her into a panda. But the only ch big choice she's made thus far is she's chosen to repress her emotions. But that repression of emotions, we find out that isn't what's causing her to turn into a pa panda. That's just something that's going to happen to her because of genetics. Breakfast is ready. Mm. Hey, no sugar. Once again, her father's a complete simp. This is going to be important, I promise. So Malin wakes up and is horrified to discover she's turned into a red panda. Her mother hears the commotion and assumes that Malin is having her period. Her mother calls it the red lotus blooming to euphemize it. The period jokes go, go on. The, basically, her mother gives her the whole talk about uh, what it's like when you have your period and you're a young woman now. And I actually think this is all a head fake. We're supposed to assume that... Becoming the Red Panda is a metaphor for uh, becoming a woman and having your period and your body changing. When actually we're going to find out the Red Panda is more a met metaphor for your emotional state. It's going to be okay. No, it's not. We just get out. Excuse me? I, I, I didn't mean that. I'm a gross red monster. <laughs> stop it. Stop talking. So in panda form, Malin gives full expression to her inside emotions. When she's angry, she's really angry. When she's sad, she's really sad. When she's scared, she's really scared. But she still may. She still hates herself for yelling at her mom. More period jokes. More period jokes. You are now a beautiful, strong flower who must protect your delicate petals and clean them regularly. When Malin tries using Zen breathing to calm herself, she finds out she can transform back into a human form. So something from her Chinese cultural heritage, the Zen breathing, is helping her cope with the panda problem. This is a great visual gag, and it establishes the rule. When she gets upset or feels any strong emotion, even joy, she turns back into a panda. Zen. <sighs> By the way, I like the detail that when she's coaching herself, trying to calm herself down, she calls herself a mature adult. So what this is underscoring is in her mind, she thinks of herself as a mature adult, but she almost definitely doesn't know how to deal with this problem. The panda has completely changed her view of herself. I packed extra snacks and herbal tea for cramps. 
It helps relax your... I got it. Thank you. Bye. So she needs to be calm on the one hand, but on the other hand, her mom upsets her and makes her feel all of these angry and embarrassed emotions. Tyler, the poofy haired bully, got a copy of one of the embarrassing drawings and spread them all around school. So we feel a lot of embarrassment cringe on uh, May's behalf. May's friends stick up for her and tell Tyler the poofy hair to go stick his poofy hair in a bucket of sand or whatever. And uh, Miriam interrogates May, and this shows that Miriam is concerned for May's well-being and is willing to kind of like press May when she knows that May is shutting her out or not talking about the problem when Miriam knows she needs to talk about the problem. So just when it looks like May is going to be okay, get everything under control, her mom shows up and makes a scene at school, brings more period pads, more period jokes. So uh, some of the problems in this movie are starting to emerge. I actually kind of like the irony of the situation that she's got to control her emotions. Everything at school is comedically making her want to feel angry or go crazy with embarrassment. And then the mom bursts in like, I don't know, like an uh, like a bull in a china closet to do the most embarrassing thing on the planet. Now, there are parents who embarrass their kids. That's a normal human thing. A lot of people relate to that. But does any is any mom who's not a complete idiot is there a woman on the planet who is so stupid that she doesn't realize that if you just bring a bunch of you know period pads and start like throwing them at your daughter at school that that's not going to be a problem this feels a bit exaggerated beyond belief for me of course may loses control and transforms into the panda very conveniently the explosion distracts everybody, and the only person who sees May transform into a panda is her mom. This will be important for exposition-y stuff. There's a comedic chase scene where May tries to run home without talking to her mom. She bumps into a lot of people. There's a gag about how when she's a panda, she acts like an animal uh, during that time of the year, if you, if you catch my drift. The first time you watch this movie, you don't know why she's a panda. You don't know what's going on. And along with May, we discover that her parents knew she was going to turn into a panda. Uh, and they just have kept this from her. Now, the dad tells the mom it's time. So what that suggests is the reason they haven't told her yet is the mom has been procrastinating on telling her while the dad behind the scenes has been thinking she's old enough to know what's about to happen to her. Things are getting worse and worse for May's mom. So this isn't like a little miscommunication issue. This is a no communication issue. Uh, this is a communication issue where by not communicating about this, they potentially could have put their daughter and other people's lives at risk. There was zero preparation or talk about how one day you are going to turn into a giant monstrous red panda. This is a severely dysfunctional household. Why didn't you warn me? I thought I had more time. You're just a child. I thought if I watched you like a hawk, I'd see the signs and be able to prepare. So we learned that their ancestor, Sung Yi, uh, was blessed by the gods to turn into a giant red panda so she could protect her family while her husband was off to war. So we're getting another angle on the panda metaphor. Maybe the panda metaphor is a metaphor for a period. Maybe the panda metaphor is a metaphor for emotions. Or maybe the panda metaphor is a metaphor for your ancient Chinese heritage. And what was a blessing became an inconvenience. Her mom explains that if she wants to be free of the curse of the panda, they have to perform a sealing ritual on a red moon, and they only get one shot at it, or she'll be turning back and forth into, a pan into panda mode forever. Now, it's implied that when you're in panda mode, and you, if you lose your temper, it's like becoming the Incredible Hulk. You could start smashing and breaking everything, but uh, we see this visually as May loses her temper, but of course, her mom, being a poor community, communicator explains this very obliquely. But any strong emotion will release the panda. And the more you release it, the more difficult the ritual will be. There is a darkness to the panda, Mimi. Her mom promises to be there to help her get through this trying time, and their bright idea is to lock Mei Mei in a room alone for a month until the sealing rit ritual. And getting locked in the room is a metaphor. Uh, you, you need to, we're going to lock you in the room. It's just like sealing up your emotions, because if you ever let your emotions out, your emotions could control you and take you over. It's, it's uh, symbolism, guys. Red.
So this scene is supposed to reinforce the idea that the dad is the emotionally supportive one in her life as opposed to her mom. But I think it just kind of ends up uh, making him come across as weak and ineffectual. Again, what is that supposed to mean? Red is a, a lucky color. Uh, he... he he starts getting on my nerves because he doesn't really do much to actually help her. He he gives her some nice conversations to pick her up, but uh, the, come on, Dad. The, maybe there's something more you can say in this situation. Maybe the dad needs to be a better communicator, too, about what the hell he means. This is awful. What are we going to do? Don't worry. We'll get through this. No one can see her like this. I never wanted this for her. So her besties come to see her. They see she's a panda and they freak out after she like hugs them and calm, calms them down. They're very supportive of her and accepting of her. So uh, the, uh, this is continuing to portray the Ch Chinese family in a negative light. When you think about it, uh, what the movie is saying is that her family's traditional Chinese family medicine and family practices uh, really suck at helping May deal with the panda problem. But the second she meets her Western Canadian best friends and they hug her and uh, show her love, that's what she needs to feel better. And that instantly fixes the panda problem for her. So, uh, man, uh, are you guys sure that this movie is uh, uh, praising Chin Chinese cultural heritage. It seems to be saying that Chinese cultural heritage is creating May's big, fat, gigantic panda problem. Go! Go become women without me! May's distraught when she realizes that turning into a red panda means she's definitely not going to be able to go to Fort Town with her besties. And once again, Miriam demonstrates she's the most emotionally intelligent of the group by showing a lot of concern and kind of maturity in the, in this situation while, while the other two are still more mesmerized by the fact that their friend's a big red panda. To make May feel better, they beatbox. Beatboxing works wonders. This is actually quite a good scene because it combines two different elements. When her friends give her a hug and May does a zen breathing exercise, she finally gets control of the panda and turns back into herself. So the idea is that zen breathing all by itself didn't help when she had like a panic attack. She tries in breathing and that wouldn't help her calm down. But when she has both of the things working together, her uh, you know Chinese background and things she's learned from her family about how to deal with her emotions, and she has her Western friends, those two things together seem to work in ways that her parents' methods by themselves aren't working. Is it gone? For now, but if I get too excited, it'll come right back. Ow, Abby, what the heck? Okay, I un I unironically love Abby. She's my favorite part of this movie. She cracked me up every time she appeared. So her friends suggest that it, now that she can control the panda, she should come with them to Fort Town. And this marks the beginning of this movie becoming all about uh, getting tickets to go to see the boy band. You guys better go. But no buts, Mir. My mom already doesn't like you. Wait, she doesn't? Her parents give her a bunch of silly tests to see if she's really in control of her emotions and can keep the panda in check. And May passes all the tests. And when they ask her how she managed to do it, she lies again. When I start to get emotional, all I do is imagine the people I love most in the whole world. <sighs> Which is you guys. May gives a PowerPoint presentation on why she should be allowed to go see Four Town, and her mother, specifically, is the one who says no. Maybe we should trust her. It's them I don't trust. Right, Jin? Uh... See? Your father agrees. No concert. And that's final. Once again, the father suggests that they should give their daughter some freedom, give her some trust, give her some room to grow, and the mother is the dominant crushing force in the household. Uh, I, I wish that this was made a theme of the movie. It's sort of treated like a joke. Oh, ha ha. The wife wears the pants in the family, but this is actually contributing to the dysfunction. He can't stand up to his wife. Uh, he lets his wife bully him. Therefore, he can't st stand up to his wife when his wife is bullying his daughter. Look at those glittery delinquents with their <gasps> gyrations. I guess the message here is if you're an immigrant from a conservative culture, you have to embrace, embrace Western degeneracy wholeheartedly. <laughs> Why on earth 
do you want to go so badly? Grubhub Perks give you deals on the food you love. The kind of deals that make you boogie. <laughs> what was that? Am I the only one who sees the danger here? Sam! 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 Malin's grandma calls, and if Malin's mom is a tiger mom stereotype, Malin's grandma is a super tiger grandma stereotype. What this is reinforcing is the idea that the burden of parental expectations is a generational one. A lot of May's problems with her mom are inherited from her mother's problems with her grandma. By the way, Malin's mom is also named May, I think this is the first time they mention it, so just for the sake of my sanity, I'm going to call Malin's mom, Mom, and I'm going to call Malin's grandma, Grandma. The next day, the girls chit-chat, and three of the besties have been forbidden to go to the concert by their parents. Miriam's only allowed to go if she raises the money herself. My parents said I could go when I'm 30. Mine called it stripper music! What's wrong with that? May's mom is watching her at school again and once again she embarrasses may and tyler the poofy haired bully laughs this upsets may to the point where she completely loses her temper uses panda strength and nearly takes his head off with a dodgeball so there's a physical danger to having the panda power me it's your mother i'm not here i never asked for anything my whole life i've been her perfect little may may if they don't trust us anyway then what's the point wow who are you i love it fight the power so Malin decides to directly disobey her mother and go to the concert anyway. Listen to the musical cue. It's the harmonious, calm music that plays when Malin is at peace with herself and in control of the panda because she's thinking of the people she loves most who are her friends. This isn't just our first concert. This is our first step into womanhood. And we have to do it together. Three out of four of these kids are going to be disobeying their parents to go to this concert. Now, on the one hand, I am sympathetic to teenage characters who make mistakes and push back against their parents. In Malin's case, her mother is unreasonable and doesn't talk to her. So it makes more sense for a character like Malin to make a decision like this to rebel against her mother's authority. On the other hand, she is choosing to rebel against her mother's authority by going behind her mother's back. Earlier, what did I say Malin's problem was? She lies to her mother. She doesn't tell her mother how she feels, and that's contributing to the situation where Malin's mother believes she is the only source of authority, the, the only light in Malin's life. As they're racking their brains trying to come up with a way to make the money to buy the tickets, Abby, the crazy and random one, asks for... A little panda. Abby, come on, May. It'll clear my mind. Just a little hint. It's so cute. Ugh, fine. So this is just a throwaway gag, but it's also suggestive of something. Abby asks for a hit of the panda, like a hit of drugs. So this doesn't make sense if the panda's just a metaphor for having your period or Chinese heritage or whatever. This, this only makes sense if the panda is a metaphor of your emotional state. It can be addictive to vent your emotions, to let your emotions out to the maximum. So turning into a panda can be addictive to Mei Lin. So Stacy and some other girls walk in the bathroom. They see that Mei Lin is a giant panda. And instead of screaming their heads off and running away, freaking out, they squee and they think she's the most adorable thing in the universe. And this is actually a really cool idea because this is changing one of the big ideas or the big rules of the story. Earlier when Mei Lin talked to her mom, her mom laid down the law and suggested that being the panda is a curse. It's something that we used to fight wars and kill hundreds of soldiers. We need to seal away the curse of the panda, and you must not let the panda out. What this twist reveals is maybe becoming the panda doesn't have to be a curse. Maybe becoming the panda could be a blessing. Maybe instead of people freaking out and trying to kill, kill her when she turns into a panda, maybe people will be tolerant and accepting of her turning into a panda. And maybe it's actually kind of cool to have this pa uh, panda power. However, what have we established earlier? We've established earlier that when she's a panda, Maylin is more prone to lose her temper. And she literally has the strength to kill someone. So uh, while I think this is a co cool rule change, the question is, are the writers going to 
land the plane? Are they going to explain whether or not it really is that important to seal away the panda? If all of the Chinese authority figures in Meilin's life think it's desperately important to seal away the panda, why do they think that and why are they wrong? Why is it okay for her to become this panda creature without risking other people? Is she chewing bubble gum with braces on? Anyway, the girls film a silly video where they make their plan to uh, raise the money to go to the concert. Later, Malin's dad's going to find this video and talk to her about it. But they have a silly fun time making this video and making their plans to disobey their parents and go to the boy band. So the gang decides to lie to their moms and say they're joining a mathletes club. So we're continuing the theme of Malin being dishonest with her mother. And she's also going to engage in serial disobedience now. Now, it's not enough just to disobey once. We're going to disobey to the absolute maximum. They're going to sell photos of the panda, which means she's going to be transforming into the panda as much as possible, contrary to the warning that the more you turn to the panda, the harder it will be to let the panda go. And they're going to be telling tons of teenagers that she turns into a giant red panda, basically just abandoning the idea entirely of keeping this a secret. Will there be consequences for this decision? Let's find out. When Malin goes home, she hides any signs of Western fashion, like her earrings. She hides any signs of selling panda products and does Zen breathing to prepare her to go back to being the good little Asian daughter in her home. Insert joke about the girls all being super boy crazy. Check out number 12. He's got delts for days. May gets stressed that they're not going to make enough money in time and starts to turn into a panda, revealing that she's not in control as she thinks she is. And Miriam, once again, is the emotionally mature one who calms her down. Now take a break and help me appreciate some boys. Okay, okay, okay. <sighs> hey, Enter our poofy-haired villain, who threatens to reveal the secret to Malin's mom that they're going behind her back if they do not agree to show up to his birthday party and have the giant red panda be the main source of attraction of his birthday. I think this is implying, by the way, that Tyler actually secretly likes uh, Malin and the big red panda. He's just too big of a jerk to ask in a nice way. He's got to ask in his evil villain way. By the way, there's definitely a weird element where they're joking about how May selling photos of herself as a giant naked panda is weirdly like May May engaging in exhibitionism, right? It's like turning into the red panda is her version of OnlyFans. May cleverly offers to do it if Tyler will give her 200 bucks, which is enough to get them the last ticket for the t concert. It's implied that Tyler is a jerk, but also just kind of wants to have friends and have a good birthday. And he's hoping that using Maylin will be a way to make him popular. Hey, dirtbag, we're in. But you only get the panda for an hour. And we're not bringing any presents. Deal. As Maylin attempts to sneak away to go to the birthday party, her mom horrifyingly asks to come to Mathletes with her. Wouldn't you rather hang with dad? Ooh. Let's get my flashcards. Uh, at night, I, I sometimes wake up and I turn to some old lady in my bed that's on my arm. A lady that I once loved, Doc. I, I don't know where to turn to. Malin desperately tries to come up with any excuse or uh, alternative suggestion to get her mom to not come with her uh, by any means necessary. This is good theming because Malin's problem is consistent throughout the movie. She doesn't know how to talk to her mom, and her mom refuses to listen to Maylin, and the father does nothing to intervene in this horrible situation. Miriam, I mean, she's a nice girl, but maybe she's slowing you down. Mom, you really don't have to come. Don't be silly. We're already on the way. But I don't want you to! So this is actually pretty good. Malin is finally starting to do something to correctly address the problem with her mom, which is to actually articulate what's on her mind, to actually tell her mom what she wants, even when uh, it hurts her to do it because she's afraid of disappointing her mom and she's afraid of breaking that uh, sort of almost symbiotic uh, girl wavelength con connection she has with her mom. But before they can have any kind of productive conversation to solve the issue, well, the movie's not over, so of course something ha bad happens. All of the, the Chinese ladies show up to uh, prepare May for the ritual with their ancient Chinese secrets. And I'm sorry, but... They, they kind of look like a bunch of stereotypes to me. The ritual, silly. She's lost weight. Oh, no, she gained weight. She looks like her mother. She looks like her father. Ladies, 
You need all the help you can get, Ming. I'm sorry, the mom's name is Ming, not May. I really wish it's my pet peeve when movies don't mention the name of the parents in the first 10 minutes, because if they don't mention the name of the parent in the first 10 minutes, they're just mom and dad for the rest of the movie, as far as I'm concerned. So, Mei Mei, you've been managing to keep the panda in? Yep, totally. So earlier when May was one-on-one -on -one with her mom, she was close to having a breakthrough and telling her mom the truth about what she wants and how she feels. But when the Asian stereotypes burst in, now that she's surrounded by uh, the expectations of her Chinese family and her grandmother, May falls back on lying about her feelings and hiding them from the family. Notice that May's grandma has a scar, and they do a good job foreshadowing in this scene that May's mom, Ming, had an especially bad red panda experience. She just thinks of my love for her, and it gives her the strength to stay calm. Exactly. Aww. Aww. More lying, more hiding her feelings. As May tries to sneak out, her grandma interrupts her, and this is great conversation because it reemphasizes the rule of you shouldn't let the panda out, and it really helps establish her grandmother as a very intimidating, battle axe sort of personality. I found this strange for a girl who hasn't let her panda out. It's, uh, it's not mine! Mei Mei, I know what you're doing. I know how hard it is to keep the beast in. It feels so good to let it out, so free. But each time you do, the stronger it gets. And then you'll be bound to it forever, and the ritual will fail. Has that ever happened? It cannot happen. So this is another conversation where they don't really solve the issue, which is believable because May's big problem is she's bad at communicating with this family. It's completely believable to me that May would be intimidated by her grandmother and not ask questions. So that's not the part that annoys me. The part that annoys me is that we as the audience are still wondering, well, what exactly are the rules of the panda transformations? Is turning into a panda dangerous? Could she go on a rampage and kill people? So although it's understandable that May can't figure that out by talking to her grandma, we're st we still have this painful open question hanging over us. Could May become dangerous if she doesn't control this panda? Your mother and I were close once, but the red panda took that away. So again, this is, this is great writing, by the way. I'm saying the fact that they're bad communicators isn't bad writing. I'm saying it's great writing. We just still have these big fat questions. So she tells her granddaughter that the red panda is what took away my wonderful close relationship with my daughter. What does that mean? She even gestures to the scar on her head, suggesting that the red panda has something to do with the scar on her face. But because she's a bad communicator, she doesn't tell May what she means by that. All May Lin knows is that somehow the red panda has caused harm and pain in her family history before she was born. I couldn't bear to see that happen to you. So no more panda. You are your mother's whole world, Mei Mei. I know you'll do what's right. So after the guilt trip from Grandma, Mei comes up with a stupid solution to the problem. She tries to split the baby. So uh, because she feels guilty about turning into the panda now, she shows up to the birthday party in the crappy panda costume, and the kids are all underwhelmed by it. This is great because... Uh, She's still not communicating about the problem. She's trying to find her own solution to the problem. But her solution to the problem uh, isn't fixing... It, 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 in trying to please everyone, she's pleasing no one. She's still disobeying and sneaking out to the birthday party. And she's trying to reserve and control her emotions so she's not fun at the birthday party. Are you feeling okay? So once again, Miriam's the emotionally mature one. So she asks Malin questions about... Are, are you doing okay? How are you feeling? She's trying to give May an opportunity to say what the problem is. Okay, okay. It's, it's fine. You don't have to do it. We'll just, uh, figure something- I won't go. What? Priya, you can't not go. Jessie's your soulmate. But we only have enough for three tickets. Then I'll stay home. Abby, no. Um, I'll stay home. Guys, if we can't all go, then, then none of us should go. This is also an important scene because they really are good friends. They do not want to use Maylin as a panda to make money. They're just trying to help Maylin make money. So they give her permission to 
not turn into the panda if she doesn't want to. And her other friends show her selfless emotional support. So this is a great scene because they're not just goofy people she hangs around with. They're willing to make sacrifices on Mei Lin's behalf. Just one last time. So Mei Lin makes another important decision. She's going to disobey one last time. She's going to become the panda one more time so she can have the uh, girl bonding experience with her friends and go to the boy band concert. And the question is, what are the consequences of this decision going to be? The kids all disco dance and shake their booties with furry tails on what a bunch of furry degenerates. Ming, this is a critical time. Mei Mei needs a strong hand now more than ever. So this exchange between grandma and mom is important. There's a lot of great, you know, subtle body language and visual communication that May's mom is completely intimidated by grandma. She uh, is utterly reserved, a perfect little Chinese daughter who is incapable of standing up to grandma. And grandma insists that mom take an authoritarian approach with May. Don't let her out of your sight. I won't, mother. This is important character development for May's mom because we've seen she's kind of like a ridiculously exaggerated to comedic proportions, overprotective helicopter parent. Uh, we're finally getting an, a vi clue as to why her mom is like that. That's the way grandma raised mom. So that's the way mom raises May. It's a generational problem. There's a really nice subtle detail in this scene, by the way, so I want to call attention to it because I really liked it. When May's mom goes to check on her, she sees the window is open. She feels sympathetic, so she goes to close the window so May doesn't get cold. So that means that her mom is actually showing some real genuine affection and concern for her daughter. Uh, and maybe she wasn't coming to be overbearing. Maybe she just wanted to check in on her and make sure she was doing okay and close the window. But as she does that, she stumbles across May's stash. And there's this weird fur baby shirt. It's weird because it's like they're trying to jokingly allude to real life furry degeneracy, but not quite. But basically, she discovers that her daughter is a closet weirdo. Her, her daughter is what, what she was afraid of, which is all the crazy Western degenerate hip hoppers with their gyrating hips. The girls look forward to going to the boy band concert tomorrow and becoming women. And there's even more jokes about the girls being thirsty. What do you think Jesse smells like? Milk, chocolate, and wet rocks. <laughs> so romantic. May, what if you didn't do the ritual? What if you kept the panda? What? Okay, so Miriam finally asked May the question we in the audience have been wondering. Why is it important for May to do this ritual at all? Why not keep the panda? Now, symbolically, these are her Western individualist friends asking her, why not defy your Chinese uh, family's cultural expectations for you? You the bomb! Word. You the bomb, May. Oh, you the bomb! We all the they do some girl power emotional validation of each other, and they hear on the radio that they got the date wrong. Boytown isn't coming on the 18th, they're coming on the 25th. It conflicts directly with the sealing ritual for the Red Panda spirit. So May's been trying to avoid making a definitive choice between her family and her friends. She's going to be forced to choose between her family and her friends. This news triggers an emotional breakdown for May. She turns into a panda. She's completely distraught. And again, we're getting a little reminder that in rage mode, she could be dangerous to herself and her friends. What about our deal? Shop your deal! Fine! Get out of here! Go back to your psycho mom and, and your creepy temple, you freak! <laughs> Tyler asks her to give more rides to people at his birthday party. She's completely furious. She yells at him. He yells back at her. Uh, she snaps and attacks him in giant panda bear mode. Uh, this, is a, this is a great climax for May's problem of... Uh, not understanding how to deal with her emotions. She's either constraining her emotions or they're exploding out of her in a gigantic uh, tidal wave tor tornado. I also like how this is making Tyler uh, more sympathetic than the average bully character. So, you know, he says a lot of mean things to May, but he actually has uh, his side of the story, which is he's paying her to be here entertaining uh, his, his friends. So he feels like he's getting cheated. And when she attacks him, uh, he cries. And it's, a, a, it's an ugly scene. We see an ugly side of May and we feel sympathy for Tyler. We see how she uh, can hurt someone in panda mode when pushed to an extreme. 
I mean, clearly expects her mom to blow up at her for doing this, but her mom actually blames her friend group. Her mom's problem is she can't imagine her perfect little Chinese doll daughter disobeying in this way. So it must be the wicked friends perverting and corrupting my perfect daughter. She needs to confront her mom and tell her mom the truth. And once again, May fails to confront her mom with the truth. You manipulated her for a bunch of tacky delinquents? No, she wanted to. Don't you blame her. It's also important for me to tell the truth because her mom has an incomplete picture of the situation. She is assuming that May's friends are using May to make money. If that were true, then May's mom would be completely justified in telling them to leave her daughter alone because that would be a terrible thing to do. We in the audience know that that's not what happened. May chose to do this over the... Uh, over and against her friends who told her that she did not have to do this and they were just going to be fine being her friend anyway. They were putting no pressure on her to do this. May chose to turn into the panda herself. When confronted by her mom, May chooses to stay silent and stay closed. So she basically allows her mom to think that it's all her friend's fault and uh, she uh, is going to allow her mom to pull her back into her mom's world where her mom is the absolute authority over her and she never says anything or stands up for herself. <sighs> Four is the worst number. You know Vivian was due on the fourth, but I held her in until the fifth. Quiet, Lily. When her grandma sees the advertisements for four towns, her grandma's upset because four is considered a very unlucky number and the number of death in uh, Chinese cu culture. Uh, again, really on the nose, the Chinese cultural heritage is at war with the Western Canadian culture. Her dad notices that she looks kind of sad, and so he's going to go give her some emotional support. So on the one hand, this is kind of nice because her dad's an emotionally supportive parent, but he's so weak, he can't stand up to all these battle axes in his family. Jin, huh? help clear the table. Uh -huh. Her father finds the video camera where they made the home video of them goofing around as a panda, and he notices that his daughter seems very happy goof goofing around with his with her friends. So he's putting two and two together. He's emotionally concerned for his daughter. He's intelligent enough to pay attention to details and give her a chance to talk to him about how she's feeling. This is reemphasizing again that she has no ability to talk to her mother about it. Her mother is just closed on the topic of what her panda was like. And we're going to finally get some exposition on what exactly happened to cause grandma's scar and to drive grandma and mom apart. What has she told you about her panda? <sighs> Nothing. She won't talk about it. It was quite destructive <laughs> and big. She almost took out half the temple. She and your grandma had a terrible fight. Your grandma didn't approve of me, but you should have seen your mom. She was incredible. So the panda is a metaphor for her emotions. And I feel like this is a scene where the panda element is actually fighting with the human element rather than aiding the human element. For example, the dad says her mom was amazing when she stood up to grandma. Well, does he mean that she was amazing when she turned into a giant Godzilla monster? Is he just really into giant, destructive, rampaging beasts knocking over buildings and temples? Or does he mean that he admired her because she was brave for standing up to grandma. Uh, can, you, can you see how those are like co two completely different th things, right? Like it's good to be strong and stand up to your mom if she's being a herod and telling you you can't marry that guy, but it's uh, bad to turn into Godzilla. Uh, and then the second thing is, well, what's he telling her to do in this scene? Is he telling her to defy her mom and keep the panda? He doesn't seem to be saying that. What he is doing is he's, he's, he's telling her, I like this other side of you, this silly, fun side of you where you goof around with your friends. You don't have to be your mom's perfect little doll all the time. It's okay for you to have this messy side of yourself and make room for that. So uh, this is actually, the scene is supposed to be her dad having a really good conversation with his daughter where he's giving her guidance and giving her permission to have a free side to herself. But but the panda part is what's confusing it. Uh, he, he doesn't say, therefore, you can keep the panda. He doesn't ask a question like, do you want to keep the panda and try to c control the panda? He's more concerned with the side of it where he wants May to have 
some freedom and some flexibility to express herself outside of her mother's influence. But again, because he doesn't stand up to his wife and the grandma, he just leaves May to decide whether she'll be, uh, become a giant destructive panda or, or not with, without his guidance. So I think it's kind of a, it, I know it's attempting to have the dad be the positive parental figure in May's life, but, uh, the unanswered questions about how dangerous the panda really is, is distracting from the human element here. People have all kinds of sides to them, May. And some sides are messy. The point isn't to push the bad stuff away, it's to make room for it, L live with it. Nice touch. She instinctively hides the camera from her mom without even thinking about it. Really subtle. I like it. This scene reemphasizes May being caught between two cultures again. They start performing the ritual and they use ancient Chinese chants to do the sealing ritual for the panda spirit. The shaman actually admits that it doesn't matter what you sing, it only matters that you sing from the heart, but her grandma's old school and likes super traditional uh, Chinese chants. Later, we're going to see that other people can sing and make the ritual work without knowing ancient Chinese rituals. The shaman hits her with an ancient Chinese lobotomy laser that teleports her to the spirit world. She uh, encounters her ancestor who started the red panda spirit shenanigans, and she has to walk through a portal that will separate her from the panda spirit forever. It's clearly painful. At the last possible second, she remembers all of the wonderful experiences of being a red panda and decides she can't be parted from the red panda spirit. Now, the Red Panda spirit isn't a character. It doesn't like have conversations with her, so it's not like being separated from her friends. The Red Panda spirit is her. It's her emotion. So she decides to remain connected to her uh, uh, emotional, uh, expressive self that uh, her, her friends encouraged her to keep. And so she spectacularly fails the ancient Chinese ritual. And we've been told before that she only got one chance at doing this in her life. May transforms into the panda and declares that she's going to keep the panda spirit and that she's going to the concert. Now, of note here, her dad, along with everyone else in her family, is trying to stop her from going to the concert. So earlier when her dad was talking to her about how he liked that the sight of her and he wanted her to have some freedom of emotional expression, he clearly wasn't thinking, oh yeah, I want you to keep turning into a giant red panda monster. He wanted her to solve her uh, emotional issue, and he's clearly as surprised as everybody else that her uh, way of expressing her agency and her freedom is to remain a giant red panda monster forever. When uh, May knocks over her mom, she breaks the necklace that is sealing her mom's panda spirit. So as a consequence of May's actions, her mom's pa red panda is going to be released as well. So as May runs to the concert, she does a lot of cool parkour, and the idea is that uh, as a panda, May's extremely good at moving through the world as, as a panda. She's confident, she's capable, uh, she can run and jump and use her panda powers really well. So this is her, her most emotionally free before trouble strikes. Also, she sneaks into the concert without paying a ticket. I see what you did there. May, you threw us under the bus. I know, and I'm sorry. I've been like obsessed with my mom's approval my whole life. I couldn't take losing it, but losing you guys feels even worse. Well, too bad. You did. So I think the first two acts of the movie are actually really well written. They establish the emotional stakes, they establish the family dynamics that are creating uh, May's problem with emotional repression. I basically feel like the last act of the movie feels rushed and lets down the promise of the first two acts. So May talks to her friends and Miriam is unwilling to forgive her. And this hurts because Miriam has been the most understanding and most willing to listen to May and talk May through her problems in the past. So it's obvious Miriam was hurt by May throwing her under the bus. So you think, oh no, how is May going to get her friends back? And then the Tamagotchi lights up and it turns out, oh, Miriam was taking care of her Tamagotchi for her. She knew they were going to get back together 
all along. Well, really, so it's like it's like a magical, fortuitous circumstances are helping things work out for May, uh, and it's it's sort of taking away May's agency. What would have happened if the Tamagotchi didn't light up? Was Miriam's plan to never forgive May and close her out of their friend group uh, forever? And then just luckily, the little Tamagotchi reminded her that oh, we all are friends. After all, what does May do to win her trust back from her friend? She doesn't do anything but show up and apologize. And then uh, they're mad at her for 10 seconds. And then magically, Tamagotchi heals their broken friendship. Tyler, the poofy haired bully, shows up and it turns out he's a closet four town fan. Uh, I feel like this is Disney sort of kind of not really trying to do gay representation but being cowards about it so they have the mean bully show up at the goofy boy band concert and scream i love you at the pretty boys so maybe that's because he's gay and repressed and maybe that's what the reason he's a bully but they never come out and say it and they could also cover their butts and say oh that doesn't necessarily mean he is gay maybe he's just a got a straight guy who likes boy bands i kind of wish disney pick a lane disney uh karate yes okay karate no okay you karate guess so <laughs> squish just like grape they they disney desperately wants to take the middle road uh of uh lgbtq representation for props but never anything controversial or offensive to midwestern moms so it turns out may's mom when she turns into a panda is a giant godzilla monster. And May didn't know that because nobody communicates at all with May in her family. This also means that May is either partially or maybe fully responsible for causing a giant Godzilla attack. Uh, they, they make it ambiguous. Uh, she damages her mom's medallion, then her mom loses her temper and becomes the monster. So is that the mom's fault for losing her temp temper? Uh, or the, the second that uh, May damaged the medallion, was this doomed to happen? They don't answer that question, but at the very least, May is, it is responsible in part for causing this Godzilla attack. People panic. The boy band screams their head off in, with looks of pure terror. <laughs> they, they are probably peeing their pants right now. So this is an exaggerated version of May's problem with her mom in earlier scenes. She had this problem where her mom would show up at school and embarrass her in front of all of her friends. Now her mom's showing up as a giant Godzilla monster and threatening to cause a panic and kill the <laughs> boy band that she's that she wants to enjoy. Uh, no one ever says to May, hey, May, you kind of turned your mom into a giant Godzilla monster. The the writer's solution to how does May take responsibility for this problem she's created is to have no one acknowledge that May is responsible for creating this problem. So let's talk about the symbolic element of the red pandas and her mom. So uh, the, the fantastical element is you turn into a magic panda. The symbolic element is the panda is your feelings. So when her mom turns into a giant Godzilla red panda, this is uh, metaphorical for her mom losing her temper and becoming emotionally abusive. And May's never seen the side of her mom before because her mom is not usually emotionally reserved. Her mom's always trying to hold in check this anger. It's exploded out and she's yelling at her daughter and make, making a scene. So she has to stand up to the giant panda monster, which is symbolic of her mom's emotional uh, abusiveness. The fantastical element is also kind of confusing. Uh, in order to stop her mom, they have to perform the sealing ritual on her mom. But earlier in this movie, we established that you only get one chance in your life to seal the panda spirit. And if you screw it up, you will be haunted by the threat of turning into a panda forever. So uh, according to the rules of this movie, you would think that she's screwed up forever. Her mom's going to have to be a panda forever. But ah, never mind. Uh, if we just perform the sealing ritual, we'll, we'll fix her mom. Uh, I'm kind of annoyed at this because this isn't an incidental rule. Uh, the rule that you only get one chance to contain the panda spirit what was, was what was creating the dramatic tension for the first part of the movie. Oh no, May only gets one chance to uh, seal away this panda spirit. Well, apparently that, that's out the window. That uh, Were you worried about that? You had nothing to worry about. Everyone, go home! Where are your parents? Put some clothes on! Haha, <laughs> her mom's conservative and doesn't like kids these days. What? 
What? So when May makes her declaration to her mom, this part is actually pretty good because up to this point, she's been lying to her mom. She's been hiding the truth from her mom. She finally comes out and admits the truth. I lied. I was the one who had the idea to hustle my pan- the panda. It wasn't my friends. It was me who defied you. And I don't want to live under your authoritarian control all my life. So as May's mom is stamping around and yelling in a gigantic booming voice, she is a metaphor for an authoritarian uh, Oedipus type of mother that's completely controlling and domineering over her child's life and the emotional hurt of having to deal with this big, gigantic monster with the emotional maturity of a toddler. May's solution to this is to yell back at her mom things to make her mom even more upset. Get back here! Me. You think you're so mature! Lying to me! Oh, that's nothing! You want to see crap? Stop moving like that! Is this bothering Stop. you? Stop. Take it Move. Move. Take it. Now, put aside the emotional human side of it. Think about the fantasy side of this. What's May's bright idea? Oh no, a giant monster is attacking. Uh, We've made it angry, and when she gets angry, she starts destroying things. Her bright idea is to make the giant Godzilla monster even angrier. There isn't even a clever explanation where it's like, oh, I know, if I make her angry, I can trick her into walking into the circle, and then we'll seal her. May goes right to the kind of like immature teenage way of dealing with this problem. So on the one hand, she's spent all her life being completely submissive to her mother, being unable to stand up to her mother, being unable to talk to her mother, lying to her mother. Now she's going to tell her mother the truth and be as outrageous and obnoxious as possible in front of her mother, making her even angrier. Uh, This, by the way, is the climax of the movie. This is where everything is coming together. This is where May is supposed to be standing up to her mother and becoming a, a hero and... May as hero is actually probably making things worse uh, and is fighting with her mom because she's mad at her mom and doesn't even seem to care that much or be aware that much of what the rest of the family is trying to do uh, to make the circle and seal her mom. If you're going to do something about having an emotionally abusive parent, you can't have the message to kids be, hey, kids, try twerking in front of your mom when she's having a meltdown. See, that'll make everything better. Hooray! Hooray for twerking! And Western values overcoming traditional Chinese values! Hooray! In this scene, May's still spanking her butt to try to provoke her mom even more. Then her mom swishes her tail around and nearly kills everybody. May has not thought this plan through. (laughs) Now, Miriam, although she wasn't there for the explanation of how the ritual works, she somehow instantly realizes that if she can get four... Uh, for town to start playing, then they can fix the problem. There's no way Miriam could know this. She uh, magically knows that uh, with the power of boy bands, they can add the combine the power of boy bands with the power of ancient Chinese ritual chanting to save the day and stop the mom from being a monster. The reason I alluded to the other children's movies in the first part of the video is I think this scene hurts the entire movie because of the seriousness of an emotionally abusive parent being undermined by how May is supposedly supposed to be heroically handling it. Uh, Nemo, in Finding Nemo, defies his father by touching the boat. He engages in a deliberate act of disobedience to defy a father who is overbearing and overprotective. That decision sets the whole course of the movie in motion because Nemo gets kidnapped by a guy who's scuba diving. Marlon spends the whole movie desperately trying to become a hero so he can save his son. Nemo learns how to live uh, and become a man while away from his dad and learns to respect his dad. And when they meet again, Nemo Uh, earns his dad's respect by saving Dory's life. So Marlon has become a man to save his son. Nemo has grown into a young man so that his father will be okay letting him go. Uh, Kent, now I've heard some people argue that, well, maybe the point of this movie is not to say that there's an easy Band-Aid solution to something like an emotionally abusive mother, which is true, but that's not a good argument for this movie because it is offering a solution to May's abusive 
mom problem. And it's basically to have maybe even more emotionally abusive than her mother and uh, in a way to beat her mom in a fight. So how does May overcome her mom's emotional abuse? By headbutting her really hard. So May just is better at domestic abuse and physical abuse than her mom is. And that's when, what's going to fix the problem of her mom being a monster. Oh, I want <laughs> So May's screwed up again. So by hitting her mom, she's knocked her outside of the circle. She didn't do a good job of keeping her mom in the circle, which was you had one job, May. So it looks like uh, they're going to miss their window. Her mom's going to be a panda monster forever. But all of the Chinese ladies break their medallions and become red pandas to help May save the day. Now, if we were obeying the rules of the story, this would actually be a really emotionally effective moment. The, the earlier ruler of the story is you only get one chance. And if you miss your chance, you're, you miss it forever. What we find out, if all of these ladies made the sacrifice of having to live with the panda forever in order to save May's mom, that would be incredibly meaningful. But of course, everybody gets fixed at the end. Everybody gets their panda spirit uh, sealed at the end and basically no harm, no foul. Raising the question why it was so urgent to have May do the sealing ritual in the first place if you can break the medallion every any time. And just so long as you do it before the red moon ends, I guess it's just, it's just back to normal and uh, no problem. So, so Symbolically, this is May's Chinese family coming to her aid in a time of need. The boy band starts singing and the singing harmonizes with the Chinese ritual. So symbolically, what this is saying is everything in May's Western Canadian world is starting to harmonize with her Chinese cultural background. She's becoming a whole and complete person. Therefore, the two parts of her lives are coming together to help her out in this time of need. Now, the last time we saw Four Town, they were peeing their pants in absolute terror for their lives. So I guess uh, her May's friends were able to convince them, hey, if you sing boy band music, we will seal the panda spirit. And they just instantly believed it. You know, uh, this is just like a little, I don't know, like fan fiction headcanon idea. What if uh, what if we had more scenes with the boy band and the boy band actually had to like help the Chinese family running around to contain the spirit? Then we could get like funny scenes where like grandma could say, wow, you young uh, boys, you're not as bad as I thought you were. It, it's, uh, you know what, I'll forgive it. You, you have to forget, suspend d your disbelief a little bit for these movies. And I actually kind of like the, uh, from a visual perspective, I like the symbolism of having the Western side of May's life combined with the Asian side of May's life to solve the problem. So in my opinion, the ugly fight between May and her mom is one of the worst scenes in the movie because it's battling with the really well done theme of uh, coping with a authoritarian and emotionally distant parent. Uh, this scene is much, much better because May discovers that her mother is a human being too. So she's back in the spirit world. She wanders in the spirit world and she sees a teenage version of her mother having an emotional breakdown and being afraid that she'll never be able to please the grandmother. So May's finding out that her mom is like her in a lot of ways. May has emotional problems with her mother and feels like she'll never be good enough for her mother. Mom has emotional problems with grandma and feels like she'll never be good enough for grandma or good enough for anybody. May's discovering that her mother is, isn't perfect. Her mother is a human being with flaws. You undermine the emotional power of a scene when you add twerking into it, and you undermine uh, the heroism of a character by having them make yelling and parade, prancing around be what can, the thing they do to fix the problem of their inner emotional conflict. But this scene is actually really, really good because uh, it's about seeing that you are not the only person in the world who has inner emotional turmoil. And understanding that is actually a really good stepping stone to dealing with your own emotional turmoil is to realize it's not just you who feels this way. Now, earlier what I've argued is that I think the fantasy element is actually distracting from the human emotional element. I'm going to try to come up with a headcanon to see if I can explain this. So throughout the movie, we've been hinting that becoming a panda 
puts May at risk of hulking out and losing her temper, and she has ungodly strength, so she could uh, destroy or kill a bunch of people. Uh, apparent, what, what I'm going to assume is maybe only May's mom has the problem of turning into a Godzilla monster, and that we're supposed to believe that as long as May stays a panda, it'll be okay as long as she's in control of her motion. She's not increasing the risk of going on a rampage and uh, destroying people. What I find really hard to believe is that her Chinese family would instantly accept that she's going to remain as a panda. Because what is May done to prove that she is in control of her panda at this point? The only time we've seen her in action, she's been really angry and out of control, uh, essentially. The entire movie, the Chinese family has been acting under the assumption that she must control the panda. What is proven to them that it's theoretically possible to live your life as a panda without the risk of becoming a monster and destroying everything. Everything in uh, May's cultural background and her family dynamics is magically turning on a dime to allow her to be free because it's the third, it's the third act of the movie and we've got to wrap things up. No, Mimi, please, just come with me. I'm changing, Mom. I'm finally figuring out who I am. But I'm scared it'll take me away from you. I see you, Meme. You try to make everyone happy, but are so hard on yourself. And if I taught you that, I'm sorry. Also, in contrast to the fight scene, I think this conversation between May and her mom is a much better example of modeling how to talk to your mother about what you want out of life and who you want to become. She's telling the truth and articulating what she wants out of life. This is in contrast to how May used to lie and not articulate anything before. The final scene, May monologues to bookend the story. In the first scene, she delivered a monologue and we saw how she thinks she's immature, but she really isn't that mature. In the last scene, it's her monologuing again, so we can see how much she's grown. May's mom has her panda spirit contained in Tamagotchi, and this is sort of symbolically saying, see, now she's a cool mom. Uh, she's not, uh, she still does, you know, traditional Chinese rituals with her kid, but she's not quite as reserved. She's a little bit more open-minded to Western culture, and she's got a ta the magic of Tamagotchi fixes everything. Uh, grandma, her panda spirit was sealed in the number four, which she considers unlucky. Ha ha. It's, uh, it's funny because she's a traditional Chinese lady. There's a really neat uh, detail in the temple ceremony that uh, is reinforcing one of the points of the movie. So she gets to be a real panda uh, when they give tourists uh, tours of the temple, right? So what's cool about this is in the first scenes when she was doing this, she was dressed up in a goofy cardboard panda costume. When she went to Tyler's birthday, she dressed up as in the panda costume because she was afraid to turn into a panda. So she was a fake panda. She was pretending to be someone she was not. Now in the last scene, she gets to be who she truly is, and she, and she does it with parental approval. So they found a way to make uh, May's panda identity uh, a part of their Chinese cultural heritage and to make the, the tour, the Chinese temple tour, even better. So everything is magically worked out for May because she yelled at her mom <laughs> and headbutted her. Uh, the, yeah, so it, imagine... The, the only way I can try to express my problem is... Imagine if the entirety of Finding Nemo, uh, we didn't get the, any of the big adventure, all of the movie focused on Marlin following Nemo to school and uh, uh, embarrassing Nemo by making a fuss over him at fish school. It all builds up to Nemo uh, heroically telling his dad, I hate you. He runs, he swims over to the boat and touches the boat to disobey his dad, then fights his dad, <laughs> and then that's what fixes his broken relationship. With, with his dad. Maybe they have like a mystical journey to the spirit world to, to help them have it. Uh, in How to Train Your Dragon, Hiccup has a very difficult relationship with his dad. Imagine if instead of Hiccup having to fight a giant dragon monster at the end of the movie, imagine that he had to have a fight with his dad at the climax of the movie, and the whole time the dad monster is yelling, you're not my son, and Hiccup's yelling about how his dad's a big stupid jock who will never understand him. The, the ugliness isn't being used to build up to May taking responsibility for her action and learn how to love and appreciate her mother while becoming her own person. 
the ugly fight scene was the climax. Then they tried to fix it with the mystical experience in the, sp the spirit world. Uh, I, I just think this is a structure problem. Something one fix would be have been to make May less obnoxious and not abusive in the big fight scene. I think that would have done a lot to fix it. If you if and if your argument is well, I think that we should have an ugly fight scene in this movie. Okay, let's put the ugly fight scene earlier. So let's put that towards the beginning of the story. Have an ugly fight scene between mom and daughter. Then May realizes what she's done and feels terrible about it and spends a whole movie making up for the mistake she made of beating the crap out of her mom. So I can't sympathize with this character. I, I am sorry. That's my thoughts. That's our scene by scene analysis. I'm number one Marmaduke fan. I love you guys. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the aesthetics of this movie because I already talked about the aesthetics in my short uh, video. So catch you later. One of these days. Pow! Right in the kiss. <laughs> Bang! Soon. I'm going to the moon. <laughs>